Hello and welcome to The Daily Space for today, January 17th, 2019. I am your host, Dr. Pamela Gay, and I am here to put science in your brains. Uh, we have a variety of news coming out today, um, and some of it harks back to discoveries made in the past, and some of it uh, looks forward to science or at least cool, cool stuff that will be happening in the future. It, for the most part, does not involve NASA. Thank you, Veronica Cure, for the bits. Can we light up the chat, everyone? Hello. I'm going to pause for a moment and say hello to everyone who's saying hello. Uh, hello, Mike Cassidy. Hello, Noel Hexacorn. I'm taking that rocket as a hello. Um, hello, Veronica. Hello, Larry. Hello, Guido. Hello, Ironhead. Hello, Keeper. Hello, Fenring. Hello, all of you. Hello, Hazard 6S. Um, so today we have stories, well, I guess old and upcoming. So in today's prettiest story, we have new images stitched together showing us the full globe of the moon Titan. These are images that were acquired by the Cassini space probe over the many years that it orbited round and round Saturn periodically, um, getting close enough to Titan to capture fabulous images. These are stitched together from bits and pieces that were taken under a myriad of lighting conditions that were taken, well, like puzzle pieces that had to be fixed in Photoshop to get them to fit together. This need to stitch and clean and fix is why it took so long since that mission plunged into Titan's atmosphere for these images to finally come out more than a year later and say hello. Now, I could just show you these stills, but it turns out that there is a fabulous video that has been put together and zooms in to let you see more and more of what went into making this image. So this is saying these are images that were taken between 2004 and 2017 using Cassini's visual and infrared mapping spectroscope, VIMS. This particular instrument is able to pierce through Titan's atmosphere, allowing us to see what lies beneath. I. I am simply overwhelmed with how stunningly beautiful this particular world has turned out to be. It's like nothing I ever really imagined. I'm just going to sit here and let us enjoy. If you're noticing that different images uh, or different areas appear to have different resolutions, it's because not all the surface was imaged in the same amount of detail. Now some of the factors that allow Titan to have this complex geology are its gravity is significantly lower than the gravity here on Earth, but its temperature is significantly colder. This combination allows uh, things like liquid methane and ethane to be at the triple point the way water is here on Earth. That triple point, I just love that detailed image. Um, that triple point means that methane can exist as an icy solid, as a liquid that rains out of the sky and of course as a gas. So with that triple point of methane we are able to see on Titan methane is filling that same geologic role that earth filled that on earth is filled by water allowing rivers and lakes storms all to form and and that actually gets us to our second story of the day. Here we have an image showing the polar region 
of Titan. In this particular image of the Northern Hemisphere, what we see is dark streaks within that Kraken Mare, the Kraken Sea. And that darkness is likely caused, um, sorry, the bright spot next to it, the wet sidewalk ephemeral region. That brightness nearby is likely caused by rain that has fallen and left the surface, well, wet as rain happens to do. Now, again, this isn't water rain. This is liquid methane. But again, the, the methane is forming, is filling that same geological niche that water fills here on Earth. So what's cool about this image, we already knew there were lakes, we already knew there were storms, we've tracked well, rainfall across the surface, the same way we do here on Earth. We look for the soil to get dark, that means it rained. Well, in this case, this particular image allowed us to see uh, on June 7th, 2016, that, well, essentially the spring rains had come and the summer season was starting. So this marks the change of seasons on Titan, and we're now able, looking retrospectively back through the data, carefully looking for things that, well, people weren't finding the time to look at the first time. We're now going back and we're uncovering amazing science and it will be years, perhaps decades, before all the science that can be found without future images being taken has been found in these images from the Cassini spacecraft. Now, this is work that is coming to us from the University of Idaho, where they are digging in to the already released images from Cassini. Uh, these are all publicly available images. Any of you who wants to go download these images, you can. And the folks at the Unmanned Space Flight Forums, which is part of the Planetary Society, they will help you learn how to process them. So, um, Congratulations, University of Idaho. This is beautiful work you've put together. And as the French subtitles on the last video let you know, um, that was work that was coming to us from the University of Nantes, working in collaboration with many other institutions. Science is global. And in these times, that global open access mentality is what allows the science to keep going even when for so many, the science funding and access is cut off. Now, in other news, we have um, an update on our understanding of, well, hypernova. These are those things that go boom with the kind of violence that if one occurred nearby, it, it could tear the atmosphere off of our planet. Um, this is research that's coming to us, and I'm going to destroy the pronunciation of this. I, so many apologies. This is coming to us from the Institute of the Astrophysica di Andalusia. So this is coming to us from the, Andalus from the um, Institute for Astrophysics of the Andalusians. Uh, this is research that was done using the Gran Telescopia Canaris uh, on the island of La Palma. What is shown here? is a uh, gamma ray burst 171205 that means it was found on 2017th on in December on the fifth day and this particular gamma ray burst was detected in a galaxy that is just 500 million light years away and while 500 million light years may sound huge and let's face it it is really far away the light from this system was first emitted like before the earth was even lined up with continents where they are right now. This is old light we're seeing. But this old light allows us to see what to us is one of the four closest gamma ray bursts that has ever been detected. And this particular system was detected less than a day. It was detected in the optical less than a day after the gamma ray burst first went off. Now, 
there's two different kinds of gamma ray bursts. There's the short ones, which are generally caused by two neutron stars colliding, as far as we know. And then there's the longer ones that appear to be triggered by hypernova events. This is a special kind of supernova that occurs when the star is 25 times more massive than our sun. We've seen a bunch of hypernova and we've seen a bunch of gamma ray bursts. And the weird thing is, while the long gamma ray bursts can generally be tied to a hypernova event, not all of the hypernova events have gamma ray bursts associated with them. And so the question has been, why? And with this system nearby and being detected so early in, in its brightening period, we were able to make out details that have never been made before. And what I'm about to show you is an artist's rendition of what's happening. This is perhaps one of the worst artist's illustrations I've seen in recent times. And we're just gonna go with this. This is what we were presented with. This is what we're gonna go with. So the idea here is you have a 25 mass or larger star. It goes through, it's doing its nuclear fusion thing, it builds up heavier and heavier elements until one day its core is iron. And with, with the lower mass, lower atomic number atoms, the hydrogens, the, the carbons, the nitrogens, the silicons, all of these lower mass atoms, when you fuse them together, the process releases energy. The binding energy of that resultant atom is less than the binding energy of the two individual atoms. So you can release that extra energy out into the universe to shine brightly in the form of photons. And that shining brightly actually works to support the outer layers of the star. Stars are nothing more than a battle between light pushing out and gravity pushing in, and they're in a state called hydrostatic equilibrium, balanced between these two forces. Now when you get that iron core, iron can't be fused to release energy. In fact, to get things heavier than iron, you have to add energy into the process. So no more light gets produced at this stage. And when you get that iron car star, the entire system collapses down violently. And as it collapses towards forming a neutron star or a black hole, there is massive nuclear fusion that goes on as things collapse. And that fusion, that nuclear bomb-like behavior blasts out the outer layers of the star. And with hypernova, you have the correct combination of mass, magnetic field, and everything else that in this rapidly rotating system, jets form, and they start to push out the poles, the rotational poles of the object. Now, it turns out that as they push out, they push out material forming these weird, what the scientists are calling cocoons on the poles of the star. And these cocoons, in some cases, don't actually allow the jets to escape. If the jets don't have enough energy to break free, these cocoons hold them in. And it's this cocoon that is defining whether a hypernova is or is not a gamma ray burst. So in situations like the one that was just observed, when we look out at the supernova that is tied in with the gamma ray burst, we're able to see jets that have pushed out through their cocoons and emerged and released that gamma ray burst. The gamma rays are tied up in these jets. In the cases where the jets can't break free, you have a hypernova without the related gamma ray burst. Now, this is new science. Our models didn't predict this. Once again, the universe has proven itself more creative in what it does than our theorists have so far been. But new data means new things to create, new things to build into our computer models. And in the future, this will allow us to better understand how stars go boom in the night. Now, um, moving on, 
coming back to the United States after our very international stories, I have news of an impending, well, its long fancy name is a super wolf blood moon. What this means is this Sunday night into Monday, Martin Luther King weekend here in the United States, there is going to be a lunar eclipse, that's the blood moon part of this name, that occurs on the full moon in January, that's the wolf part of the name, and it occurs while the moon is in the nearest part of its orbit to the planet Earth. Now, all of these things aren't all that rare in and of themselves. Eclipses are things that occur, maybe not in totality, but they occur pretty much every year. The next total eclipse won't be uh, until May of 2021. There will be some partials between now and then. Wolf moon, that's the full moon in January. We get one of those every single year. Supermoons, depending on how you define them, are more or less rare, but if you define them as when the moon appears roughly 7% larger than average, then, well, 25% of the full moons, one in four, counts as a supermoon. So we have a whole bunch of kind of rare but not really rare things all happening at once this Sunday night. And it's causing a lot of media hype, and that's okay. Use this to get your friends who don't know they like astronomy to go outside on a winter's night and look up and enjoy the sky. This will be avail this event will be visible to everyone in North and South America from beginning to end. It will also be available um, in the sunrise hours to those in Europe and Africa. So be prepared to to see the moon eclipse and enjoy it wherever you may be in the world, unless, of course, you're in China, parts of Japan, Siberia. You, you miss out on this one. I'm sorry. Only part of the world can see it. Planetary rotation and all. It sucks living on a spherical object. If the Earth were flat, we'd all be able to see this. So that's all the news I have for today. And I will now take your questions. Please go ahead and at me in the chat. And while you type that in, let me just remind you, The Daily Space is part of CosmoQuest, and we are produced by the Planetary Science Institute, working in collaboration with Youngstown State University. Speaking of Youngstown State University, tomorrow, Annie Wilson will be your host. Uh, she's going to be talking about Space IL and their upcoming, well, attempt to land on the moon. So stay tuned for that tomorrow, but you can go away and do other things between now and then. Um, if you haven't followed us yet, please give us a follow now. Follows are free and it will let you know every time we go live. This channel will work to bring you, well, launches, landing, press conferences, all the science as it happens. We also bring you the Daily Space most Mondays through Fridays at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific, that's 6 p.m. London time. So thank you all so much for being here. We are here because of you. We are able to keep going through these uh, funding cuts, through this government shutdown and everything else because of your donations, your bits, and everything you do to sustain us through your subscriptions. If you are new and you like what you see, consider, well, becoming one of our patrons over at patreon.com slash CosmoQuestX. Okay, that's it. I'm going to see what questions you've got. Okay, let's scroll up and see what has come up. Um, so Fenring is asking, what are the Venus false colors mapped to in the images? Um, that wasn't Venus, that was Titan. Um, at least, thank you, keep the map so much. Um, if, if you're referring to the images I showed earlier, that was actually Saturn's moon Titan. Um, 
And what I've been able to find in English so far hasn't told me that. Um, the world is, thank you, Kay Moore. Thank you so much. Can we light up the chat for all the bits that are coming in? Thank you. Um, so uh, the world is made of ice. And I suspect that um, the colors we're seeing aren't too horribly off of reality. Um, but then again, we haven't seen much through the clouds, so it's guesses. Ah, uh, looking to see what else is out there. Um, so Larry is asking, uh, is the time Eastern? Um, Oh, for the eclipse. So for the eclipse, the time to go out is it starts getting interesting around 1120 p.m. Eastern. That's 1020 p.m. Uh, it will end up being full totality just after midnight Eastern, after 11 Central, which is where I know you are, so I'm being biased. All of the times uh, can be found on timeanddate.com. Just give it a Google for time and date and lunar eclipse and they're also going to be live streaming it as is Griffiths Observatory and our good friend Fraser Kane over at Universe Today is also looking to try and stream it using Oceanside Photo and Telescopes instrumentation. Um, yeah Annie I yeah Ohio is about to get hit by snow. So Ironheart is asking, what are the cocoon cocoons made of? I, they're made of the same stuff as the outer layer of the star. So it's material that started as hydrogen and helium, but as it gets blasted with the high energy um, jets, there's probably what are called rapid process elements being formed. These are elements that form when you take an everyday atomic nuclei and you bombard it with uh, neutrons. The neutrons build up, build up, build up, and then undergo decay processes that convert those neutrons into protons, increasing the atomic number of that nuclei forming bigger, more interesting elements as it goes. So the cocoons are actually made of material that is evolving, which I think is super cool. So I can't tell you what they're made of because moment to moment, it's changing. Um, okay, looking to continue on. Uh, let's see. So Chai Latte Nebula, I haven't seen you in a while. Welcome back to asking questions. Um, so do cameras suffer from the same problems in resolution and diffraction like telescopes? Um, yes. In terms of you can only see things down to a certain size depending on how big your lens, your mirror is from side to side. The limiting resolution on any optical system is defined by how wide it is, how many wavelengths fit across its diameter. Now, the interesting thing about it is you don't have to fill that diameter in order for that resolution to exist. This means that the very large telescope, when they get those eight meter mirrors spread out to fairly good distances, working in conjunction with some of the other one meter mirrors they have, the resolution they get doesn't correspond to the individual eight meter telescopes. It corresponds to whatever's the greatest distance from edge to edge across this combined mirror system with individual cameras. That Nikon on your shelf is going to do a better job resolving things um, based on how big its primary lens happens to be. Now, when it comes to Cassini, it's the same camera they use all the time. And what we're dealing with is you have to get the spacecraft closer to the object to get better resolution per pixel. So here our resolution difficulties are more how close can you get? Sometimes images were taken at a greater distance and those areas of Titan, well, until we send out another spacecraft, we're just not going to see in higher resolution. Uh, let's see what else is out there. 
Um, so Larry is asking, is there water ice on Titan? I'm pretty sure there isn't. I could be wrong. Um, the bulk of it is these complex organic molecules. Uh, it is a world of things that involve carbon. Um, and chai latte pre-coffee is the worst thing a human can be, in my opinion. Go get coffee. Um, coffee. I have coffee. Uh, so Crispy Fried Man is asking, is it possible for two Earth-sized planets to merge like the way Ultima Thule, that's 2014 MU69, has? Would the gravity be different in the area where they met? So one of the reasons that you're able to get this snowman-shaped world is their overall mass is so low that gravity doesn't overcome the electrostatic molecular bonds, the minerals, the, well, the structure of those two objects. They're allowed to stay coherent. Their two centers of mass aren't gravitationally pulled together so hard that it crunches it all together into one large object. With our planet Earth, we're limited in how big we can even have mountains because gravity is going to flatten them. The, uh, it turns out Mount Everest is about as big as a mountain can be above sea level on our world before gravita gravity just is like, nope, no more. I shall flatten you. And in fact, Everest is going to get flattened over time by gravity. It's just young. Um, now, if you took two worlds, no matter how slowly you were able to bring them together and it's the slowness of the collision that allowed this particular object this snowman in our outer solar system to stay snowman shaped no matter how slowly you bring together two earth massed worlds their gravity is going to crunch them together over time creating one really big mostly spherical object it's just gravity is determined in this case to well overcome those chemical bonds and squish everything together it all comes to comes down to which is the greater force the ability of a structure to hold its structure or the ability of gravity to crush it down larger objects gravity wins um, so Fenring is asking why is rebound material not so spherically symmetrical is it due to magnetic fields um i'm i'm sorry i'm i'm not sure fenric where you're talking about the rebound material is this the cocoons on the hypernova i'm going to assume that that's what you're referring to in in this case the reason that we can get this asymmetry in the structure that we're looking at and I'll pull the graphic back up the reason that we're able to get this asymmetry is we have a rapidly rotating object that has generated magnetic fields that are creating jets that push out so it's that magnetic field where rotating um, charged particles in this case ions generate a magnetic field perpendicular to the direction of motion. It's basically a giant electromagnet. And it's that force outwards from the jets that pushes out to form the cocoons and drives that asymmetry. If you don't have the magnetic field, because it's rotating, you actually end up with something that's slightly squished. Uh, so it all comes down to where are the forces and how are they working to compress and expand the system? We have two sets of forces here. We have, uh, we actually have more than that. We have gravity compressing down. We have a rotating system where you have, depending on how you look at it, centrifugal or centripetal force um, that is creating an oblate sphere. Then you have the magnetic field with its jets pushing outwards that is driving the cocoons. Force, that whole F equals MA, really does define a whole lot of what we see out in the universe. Um, and I'm about to hit a hard stop on today just to let you know. Um, hey, Paul Pearson, I think everyone's doing well. 
coffee. Coffee is always good. Thank you, Trucker Kev, for your bits. Um, so, so Fenring is asking, is it true that a mountain on a neutron star can only be as tall as 0.5 centimeters due to the crazy amounts of gravity? Um, I don't know the exact number. I have to admit that uh, 0.5 centimeters sounds big for a neutron star, but I could be wrong. I just don't know that number off the top of my head. Um, so magnetism is magic. Yes, it's not quite magic, but wow, the math on it is complicated and it does crazy awesome things. So that seems to be running out of questions for today. Uh, we will have more science for you coming out on YouTube later on. We are recording Astronomy Cast at a special day, special time, because I'll be on an airplane tomorrow. We will be recording at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 1.30 p.m. Pacific. That is... 9.30 p.m. London time. We will be doing this on Astronomy Cast's YouTube channel. Uh, I hope to see you there. Today's topic is, well, um, radiation protocols, and not radiation protocols, uh, planetary protection protocols, and how we keep worlds safe from human, well, human beings and our germs and bacteria and all the other germs and bacteria that our spacecraft just might try to carry to other planets. So tune in and check it out. Um, beyond that, uh, I'm going to be in Boston this weekend attending the Eurasia Science Fiction and Fantasy Convention. I hope to see you there. I'll be on a myriad of panels and uh, sitting at the Broad Universe table a lot of hours selling my art. So if you're there, come say hello. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you for the bits, Chai Latte Nebula. Um, as always, this is a production of the Planetary Science Institute working in collaboration with Youngstown State University. Tomorrow, you will be hosted by the fabulous Annie Wilson. Tune in, be ready. Thank you, Pezzy, for the bits. Please just keep lighting up the chat. Um, thank you all for everything. As always, we are sustained by you. Give us a follow. They're free. Find out every time we go live. Uh, we are here to bring you launch landings, press conferences, and science as it happens. Uh, we are sustained by your subscriptions, your bits for which we are so grateful. And if you want to give more on a regular basis, please check out our Patreon, patreon.com slash CosmoQuestX. There are cool rewards. I write you a message every week letting you know what's going on and what's coming up. I hope to see you in our community, Discord, wherever it may be. And uh, have a fabulous morning, evening, afternoon, wherever in the world you are. And remember, go outside and look up. Bye-bye.